to the Montana Department of Revenue presentation regarding classification, valuation, and the natural disaster value reduction on forest lands in our great state. My name is Bonnie Hamilton. I'm a management analyst with the state of Montana Department of Revenue, and I will be presenting this presentation for you. Class 10 property is Montana's commercial forest land. In other words, it is land that is producing forest land that are forest pro um, products that are in a commercial quality and quantity to be harvested and can be um, used for a business of that type. There are approximately 14.6 million acres of forest land in the state of Montana. Only about 3.9 million acres of those are in private ownership. So those are the acres that we are looking at for our property taxation and our, therefore our classification and valuation. 15% of that total of Montana's total acres are in commercial forest land, but only about 4% of it is gonna be private forest land. So we have a very small portion of the entire state that is in the forest land classification. 156143 is the law that talks about class 10 property as a whole. This class, this law gives us a taxable percentage, or in other words, a fractional assessment. Forest land, the value, if you look at the value of the land, is going to be fairly high. However, to get to our taxable value, we're going to take that value times 0.37%. Or in other words, when you do the multiplication or the math, it's going to be the value times 0 0.0037 to get taxable value. And that value is then what we take times our mill levy. Okay, uh, Showing you a little bit of an idea, a little bit of a comparison for ag land, that fractional percentage is 2.16% rather than 0.37. Residential is 1.35. Again, forest is 0.37. In other words, it is pennies on the dollar for going from the value to the taxable value. Forest land productivity. Our values and our classification are both based on the productivity of the forest land. How do we determine what that productivity is? Well, I talked a little bit about the sites and the University of Montana had um, folks that were going out and studying those, doing an analysis of the different sites, getting that information, and then put it, they put that information into a model. Well, that was done over, or at least the oversee oversight of it uh, was done by Dr. Kelsey Milner and Dr. Hans Zurig. Um, they were working with the University of Montana and at that time we had um, a gentleman in our department, uh, Randy Pearson, who worked with them as, as a, the department forester and they put all of this into a productivity model and developed a productivity for the lands around the state and this productivity is the productive capacity of the land, and it's a measure of how much, what is its potential of growing forest land or forest um, product off of that land. It's a measure of potential, not actual. Next, we're going to talk about the eligibility requirements to get the forest land classification. These requirements are interrelated, and therefore they bounce back and forth. It, there's not an easy way to say this, it's this one totally without talking about the next one. So I will go through these and if I come across something that we haven't covered yet, it's coming. So the first one is what is the ownership of the parcel? And that ownership is of the land itself, not the timber rights. The timber rights are not included in this. We're looking at what the land can produce, so it's the ownership of the land. And within that, conservation easements, um, if there is a conservation easement that precludes logging but doesn't preclude or um, prohibit all harvest of timber, that land is still going to be classified as forest land. The land use must be 
forest land use. However, within that parcel, there can also be agricultural use or commercial use, residential use, other uses within there. But it can have a combination. It is a matter of if that forest portion meets these other requirements, but it does have to have the use of forest in order to get the forest classification. One of those requirements is that the tree species that are growing on the land must be softwoods or conifers, but not all softwoods are eligible. There are just a specific numbers and those are ones that are considered to be commercial softwood trees for Montana and those include ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, alpine fir, and Engelmann spruce. As I said, these must be commercial trees. In other words, they must be trees that produce timber in the quality and quantity that is necessary for commercial harvesting in Montana. It has to be feasible to, be to use those trees and therefore that's why it has to have the quantity there also or else they would not harvest them. That then and that amount of trees that must be grown and produced uh, requires a stocking rate and that stocking rate is 10% or greater of crown coverage and the way you see the crown coverage is looking down on an aerial view and how much of the land is um, covered by that circle if you were to draw a circle around the perimeter of the tree 10% of that forest land must be covered by um, eligible commercial trees so that is um, the question for that portion of the stocking rate. However, not all the land is covered in trees. Uh, if that has been destroyed by um, either harvesting, uh, clear cuts, etc., or by natural disaster, those we go back to what was there before. Um, or if someone is wanting to convert land that was in a different use to forest, the requirement is that there be 300 saplings per acre and this rate is based on having the saplings with a spacing of 12 foot per 12 by 12 foot per tree. Uh, I talked about the amount of productivity that they need to have in order to the quantity that the trees would produce or the land would produce for harvest and our minimum that is required is 100 board feet. In statute, it talks about it as a cubic foot per acre. Uh, we put that back to board feet per acre for um, all of our calculations, and that comes in at 100 board feet per acre. So that is our minimum productivity that it must be capable of producing for the land to be capable of producing. Now, I talked a little bit about the fact of the ownership. We're looking at what is the size of the area that actually is producing the timber and by statute for it to be forest land it has to have a minimum of 15 contiguous acres of forested land so we going we're going back to the fact that it must be 15 acres contiguous of forested land in other words that that area has to be covered in those eligible softwoods it has to have a stocking rate of 100 board feet per acre um, with 10% coverage. Those are all requirements within that 15 acres. If there's a home site in there, that there's a one acre taken out. That one acre taken out for a home site, that acre cannot count towards the forest land acres. So there has to be 15 acres contiguous. It's not the parcels that we're looking at being contiguous. It's the forested land itself. So you could have 15 acres of forest land on a parcel, but if they're not all contiguous, they do not count towards the 15 acres. Again, those forested acres um, that we're counting towards eligibility for the 15 acres have to be under one ownership and again, contiguous with that forest land on it. The one other item for eligibility is the accessibility and we do have statements that say that it must be you must be able to physically access it for um, timber harvest uh, if it's not eligible to be accessed 
then it would not be available or eligible for forest land classification. Next, we will discuss the valuation of forest lands. First off, for valuation of forest land, we have zones. We have four valuation zones. Each of those zones has a unique forest income, a unique forest cost, and an agricultural income and expense, much the way we do with our agricultural properties elsewhere. So that one will be fairly quick and easy to come to. But what about these others? Well, the number of zones depends on the market and the amount of timber produced, etc. So this is dealt with or developed for us by the University of Montana. They recommend to us the number of zones we should have and what counties belong in each zone. And we do those zones by county. They're not a county is not split between two zones. And it they deal with what how much um, travel time it is, what the costs are to one mill or another, where those are being transferred to, and group them according to their um, statistical analysis as to which zone they belong in. We do see counties change from one zone to another depending on our appraisal cycle. So they are reevaluated and change. Uh, we saw five counties change zones for the upcoming 2021 cycle. Uh, coming into the previous cycle coming in, we only had one, zone, one county that changed zones. So it just depends. Um, like I said, we're now at four zones. There was a time when we had six zones. So as mills are closing, those zones are consolidating and getting changed around. So uh, we see changes in that each time. Uh, by law, each zone is ha has the ability to have a unique forest income. Again, that's back to that market um, and why they're in those different zones. Unique forest costs and their in ag income. And also they are um, eligible to have a specific cap rate in each zone. Right now, the way things are currently, there is just one cap rate for all of our forest land. This is, um, a, an example of what the map of our zones was like for 2015 or the current cycle we've been in. And you can see we have a circle around Lewis and Clark County being the one zone that changed coming into 2015. And it previously was in zone two, which is the pink zone down to the left. And it moved up into zone three, which is our central zone. And then moving to our 2021 zones, we have a change of, like I said, five counties changed here. Uh, we had, zone, and they went in lots of different directions. Zone one, however, stayed the same. Uh, zone two shrunk, and those counties, Madison, Beaverhead, and Jefferson all moved into zone three. They kind of followed Lewis and Clark County that did that last cycle. And then we have down in Sweetgrass County moved from zone four to zone three. So zone three seems to be in the lead for gaining. And zone four gained one county, count, Blaine County from zone three for the 2021 cycle. Now, if you look at this and are familiar with the state of Montana, you'll know that zone four has very little forest land, but there is some. And so we do have that to calculate out. So that's why it's over there. A lot of that timber actually goes out of state um, into the Dakotas, goes the other direction rather than coming in back to the western part of the state. So now that we know where our zones are, and we know that we're going to calculate a different set of values for each property, but we're going to have different data to put in as our variables depending on which zone it's in. So we're gonna have different data, four different sets of data to um, calculate these. So our formula, looking very familiar, is our IRV formula, our Net income divided by our capitalization rate equals our productive value. And this time it's a forest productivity value per acre. This is always going to be a per acre value. Okay. 
Um, in 2017, our taxes were 0.16% of our property taxes um, were forest land. Uh, it's a very, very minimal portion of our property taxes. So the valuation formula, the big thing that we have to find because we know we were given our cap capitalization rate in that other is to find our net income. So this is our formula for the net income. Our net income per acre equals M, which remember I told you that was short for our mean annual increment of our net wood production. So in other words, it's the net amount of production that we're gonna get that main, the year that it grows the most. We're gonna take that times the stumpage value. This is the value of the timber on the stump before it's cut. This is what they would sell it for. This is how much it's worth, okay? And we're gonna get that, that will be an, our income, our gross income on our forest portion. And then we're going to add ag income. Why do we add ag income? Well, most of our forest land, or a lot of it, has cattle or something of that sort grazing the ground underneath. So it, the ground is not producing just the timber, it's also producing some forage for livestock. So we have an ag income. Now, at the same time that I say that, realize that that ag income is not going to be a super great amount because the main portion of the soil's productivity is going into those trees. So, but we will have some ag income. And then we have cost. And the cost is the production cost of the forest and the agricultural products. So we are going to find those two costs and put them into this formula also. Now, the way we do this is that we, the productivity, again, as I said, is from our University of Montana model. So we know what that mean annual increment is. We gain the south the stumpage values from Montana University of Montana we contract out and they provide us with those um, stumpage values for each zone what is the stumpage value per acre for each zone and um, and then we take that well it's not per acre it's per um, the board foot, the thousand board feet but um, we get that and we have that value from the University of Montana then our ag income, what it's done here is that our um, GIS folks run through and they pull up what is the average productivity under the forest land in each of those zones. And they give us what is that average productivity. That is going to be, we're going to use that in our agricultural grazing valuation formula. So we're gonna put that into our formula, same as we did for grazing land in our ag um, valuation module. And we, for the ag portion of the cost, we're going to do the same as we did in our other formula, where we're gonna use 0.25% of that is gonna be cost. So we're gonna take our ag value, our ag um, income, our ag income times 0.75 to get how much of that goes to the producer. So we've already taken the cost out for our ag commodities when we did that. Our forest costs, however, we still have to calculate that. How are we gonna deal with those? So the way we get to those is that we take the, um, contact the DNRC who have, they are the ones that manage the trust properties around the state. We gather their management costs. So it's what does it cost them in management to run their offices uh, and have staff going out, checking the properties, doing their leases, et cetera. What does it cost them for management? And that cost then we take from their different divisions, figure out which zones those are in. And then our last item on our valuation is our capitalization rate. And the capitalization rate is 8%. This is provided for us again in 1544-103 of MCA. Remember, this was our legislative intent law, and that is where it is set as to what the capitalization rate is. So we talked about the fact that natural disasters affect the uh, production of forest land very drastically. 
Um, when we speak of natural disasters, we're talking about fires, insects, and wind for, in particular. Uh, these are things that are going to come in and they're going to destroy or damage very significantly the, the timber. By law, these um, events make it cap make the property capable for or eligible for a reduction in value. It does not reduce the productivity. So don't think that the productivity is going to change. We're going to make this change in the value itself. Now, this land is eligible for a 50% reduction in value for 20 years from the date of the occurrence, beginning the year after the disaster. And the way they're going to get it is by filing an AB 26 with the department. With that, I think we have covered all of the information on our forest module. Thank you and have a great day.